This program is brought to you by the partners of A Root Awakening International. Help others find truth. Support A Root Awakening International today. Much of the Christian church and Jewish synagogue have the same problem. Both claim to be Israel, and yet they're not. In fact, Yeshua says they belong to the synagogue of Satan. Wow, what is each group missing, and how can anyone be truly Israel? Well, Michael Rood brings an answer, because it's the end of the sixth day, the sun is set, and this is Shabbat Night Live. Well, Shabbat Shalom Torah fans, it is Shabbat Night Live with Michael Rood. Do you belong to the synagogue of Satan? Well, of course you don't. Well, do you? Well, good question. Yeshua mm -hmm. said that most of us do. Yikes, what are we doing wrong? Well, Michael Rood explains this troubling warning from Yeshua in the book of the Revelation. Tonight is the final episode, don't miss this, of Charting the End, it is episode 10. Now, let's talk about that with Michael Rood and Angie Clark, welcome. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Scott. Well, uh, we were gonna talk about this love gift in a second, there's only 10 days left to get it, so we have to you know, talk about what it is. But first of all, uh, Michael, next week we have a, a, a new series starting with Jake Hilton. Yeah, that's right. And Jake is a, a former uh, Mormon, gave up a lot to do what he's doing. I mean, friends, family, Everything. all kinds of Everything. stuff. Yeah, this is gonna be an incredible series he does. Mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to it. Indeed, and now you have a, uh, a Mormon testimony. testimony. Yes. <laughs> oh dear. Okay. I, I, when he does this, look out. <laughs> I have a testimony about Mormonism. I was in the Marine Corps and I was at the, outside the base and there was a, a display about Mormonism. And they had a, 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 a picture there, and they said, Moroni, the angel, is, is the dead prophet Moroni. And I said, that's a bunch of crap. <laughs> <laughs> I said, dead people don't become angels. Dead people are dead people. Angels are angels. It can't be, it's impossible. And so I knew that, that it was wrong right from the beginning that Joseph Smith wasn't shown anything by a dead person. And, and uh, Johnny Appleseed, uh, John Chapman, was a Swedenborg, and they were telling people that people become angels. Oh, okay. <gasps> did you know that? I did not. That was Johnny Appleseed. Oh, wow. Yeah, and he said dead people become angels. Mm. And, uh, Probably he influenced uh, Joseph Smith ah. because they're both crazy. I see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so he, 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 you you can't teach it because you have to have a text to teach something. You have to have a text, but there's no text. There's nothing. The Bible does not teach that. That's a lie. You don't die and go to heaven. You, you do, there is a resurrection, but you don't die and go to heaven. And you don't die and sprout wings and become an angel. And people whose children have died, they're, they're not, uh, uh, as they say, angel mothers. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a lie. Yeah. I mean, the, the truth is fabulous enough. Why do we need to right. create lies Boy, like this? Boy, that's a good just, point. Just believe yeah. the Bible, and I mean, no wonder people are going astray, making up stories like this. It's crazy. Mm. But wow. Well, okay. Well, thank you very much. So Johnny Appleseed believed the people became angels. That's news to me. You know, and, and people have joked too that maybe the, the angel Moroni. Maybe the eye wasn't supposed to be on the end. <laughs> <laughs> Is that where moron came from? Yeah, but, yeah. but maybe it could be. Yeah, you know. but, <laughs> but Jake really knows he's been on the inside of this, right. and he really knows his stuff. And I was out there in Utah with Naomi Gordon, and we taught in a church, in a, in, in a church, and I would. They held a, uh, an assembly for me, and I taught the whole school. And, and mm. the people that, that we were staying with, they were, uh, they were uh, what do you say? Uh, multiple two to wise. 
Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. So they, they, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There was a polygamist group that we stayed with. And these people were were extolling the virtues of polygamy. Mm. Mm. But at the end of the week, they they said, we don't teach that anymore. Wow. We wow. don't say wow. that anymore. Crazy. Oh, so you set them straight. Yeah, because they said, well, it's, it's, they said, Every polygamous couple, they are miserable, mm. and it's terrible, yeah. and they they had to admit that. But they they were held up as uh, examples mm. for the polygamous church. Well, I'm glad you set them straight, Michael. Thank you for doing that. And that's <laughs> more people who know that that's not the way to go. Mm -hmm. uh, now, we have a love gift that only has 10 days left. This is it right here. This is the 300, if you uh, give a gift of $300 more, we're gonna give you something back because Michael says, hey, if you're gonna support this ministry, we wanna give something back to you to say well, thanks. We appreciate everybody that stands with us. Yes. Exactly, and this is a great thing to do because this, if you hang this in your house, this will tell everyone a little bit about your faith. Mm -hmm. This is about lighting the signal fires when when the new moon was seen in ancient Israel, this is the way they spread the word. Great thing to have in your home. All right. Beautiful. Yeah. Angie, Michael, thank you very much for being here today. Yeshua says that most who claim to be Israel are actually part of the synagogue of Satan. What are we missing? Michael Rood shares the answer right after the Kiddush. The night of the Last Supper, Yeshua took bread and he blessed the Most High. Barukata Yehovah Elohim Malakalam Hamotzi Lachem Miharetz. And he said, This represents my body, which will be broken for you. As often as you do it from now on, understand this has always represented my broken body. And often, as often as you do it, do it in remembrance of what I'm about to do for you. Then he took his cup and he told his disciples after he blessed it, after he blessed the Most High, and he said, Baruch Atah Yehovah Eloheinu Melech HaAlam, Borei Pri Hagafen. Blessed are you, Yehovah, our God, King of the universe, who brings forth and has created the fruit of the vine. And Yeshua said, you divide my cup of among yourselves. And as he passed his cup around and they poured a bit of his into their cups, it got back to him empty and he said, I will not drink a drop of the fruit of the vine till I drink it with you in my Father's kingdom. But as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. Not only that I will pay for the broken covenant, that I will pay for the transgression, that I will renew the covenant in my blood but also remember that I am waiting for you at the marriage supper of the Lamb, and that is when I will drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Until then, Shabbat Shalom. To the messengers of the congregations write, Shema, hear and obey what the Spirit says to all congregations. To the congregation in Smyrna write, these things saith the first and the last, the one who was dead and is now alive and forevermore. This relates right back to the very first vision that John saw of Yeshua. He who is dead is now alive forevermore. This is reality. He is the firstborn from among the dead and he is alive forevermore. And then Yeshua says, I know your works and your tribulations and your poverty, but you are truly rich. I know the insults you are enduring from those who say they are Jewish, but are not even Israel. They are of the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things that you might endure. Avadon, the destroyer, will cast some of you into prison to try you, and you will have tribulation 10 days. 
be faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of everlasting life. He that overcomes these things will not be harmed by the second death. These promises to Smyrna are truly a treasure. He is complimenting them because they are enduring great tribulation. They have endured great poverty, but they are rich. They are spiritually rich. And he knows the insults that they have been enduring by those who say they're Jewish, but are not, as the King James says. Not what? Not what? Not Jewish? No, they say they're Jewish, but they're not even Israel. As Paul said, that all those who are of Israel are not even Israel. Just because they're bloodline Israel doesn't mean they're Israel by the promise. Not that they are Israel by belief. See, even Gentiles can be and are grafted into Israel and become Israel. They become next of kin by the blood of the Messiah. But there were those who said they are Jewish and of course, we see that uh, throughout the book of Acts, in the synagogues, they say they're Jewish, but they're not even of Israel. They say they're Jewish because that's a religion. Jewish is a religion. It is not bloodline. Even today, we have so many people who say they're Jewish. You listen to the words and you understand the Torah is not even an issue. They know nothing about the Torah. They might keep some of the Jewish feasts once in a while, but they, they don't eat that which is, is right. They eat abominations. They reject the commandments of God. And so these people are not even Israel. They say they're Jewish because they have these traditions that they hold on to. They may put a kippah on their head. They, they, they may do some Jewish things, but the Hebrew text of the Gospel of the Revelation says those who say they're Jews, no, it says say they are Jewish, but they're not. They're not even Israel. We could also say uh, in the Christian world, those who say they're Christian, but they don't even have the Torah written on their hearts. They have not had the Torah written on their hearts. Their nature has been changed. They still have enmity against the Torah. They're still a natural man. They've just got a change of religion. And so it is with those who are Jewish. They may not even care about, want to know about, they certainly don't have the Torah written on their heart because if they did, they would want to do it. And these are the people that are constantly deriding them, they are insulting them, they say they're Jewish, but they're not. They're the synagogue of Satan. That's the only group that they belong to. And this is not to say that, that all Jews are the synagogue of Satan. That's ridiculous. It's this example that he's giving right here. In Smyrna, there were those of the synagogue of Satan. They say they're Jewish, but no, they're not. They're, they're a Pharisee synagogue, but they have no compunction to obey the Torah. They don't want to. They had their own religion. They've added thousands of commandments. They've removed thousands of commandments. They are not Israel because Israel is by faith. It is grafted in anyone. They can be of the seed of Abraham and still not be Israel because it's by faith. It's not by bloodline, and that is what the issue is. It says, do not fear those things that you might endure. Avedon, the destroyer, as it says in the Hebrew text of the Revelation. The Avedon, the destroyer, will cast some of you into prison and you shall have tribulation 10 days. That's for a, a designated, a short period of time. Now, before you get too far ahead, uh, we first of all, we understand that Avedon, the destroyer, is revealed at the fifth trumpet. That is when he is revealed. And when Avedon, the destroyer, is revealed, 
He's going to cast some of you into prison and you're gonna be tried 10 days, but be faithful unto death. So when you thought, well, 10 days isn't that bad, well, it's telling you in those 10 days, in that short amount of time, be faithful. It's not gonna be that long. Compared to eternity, 10 days is nothing. And I, I believe that this is a figure of speech. It's not a literal 10, 24 hour period of time that you're gonna be tried. No, you're gonna be cast into prison. It's for a designated period of time. And when you, when you are killed, when they kill you, when you are faithful to death, that's the end, that's the end for you. We also see this very thing in the those souls under the altar who are crying out for justice. And they are told, rest for a while. You have white garments. These are your white garments. You've secured these white garments. You have to rest until your fellow servants are killed because they too must be killed. This is going to happen. And this is what the believers need to know that in this time, in the book of Revelation, there is going to be horrendous persecution. Yeshua said, except those days would be shortened, there would be no flesh saved. But for the elect's sake, they will be shortened. Yeshua will return. He will rescue us before mankind literally brings himself to complete annihilation and destruction. We don't have to worry about the world having only 12 years left before it's destroyed because of plastic straws and shopping bags. That is not going to end the world. But mankind is gonna bring himself to the brink of destruction and that, that very march to destruction will be interrupted. Yeshua will not let it happen because he is going to come back. He is going to put this world back in order. We will be priests and kings with him and we will reign with him. This earth is not going to be destroyed. It doesn't mean that we are to be bad stewards of what we have. We are to be good stewards. We're going to try to be salt and light to this world and in this generation. So, Abaddon, Abaddon, the destroyer is going to put you in prison, you're gonna be tribulated, you're gonna have pressure, you're gonna, some of you are gonna die, it's only for 10 days, but be faithful to death. And Yeshua says, I will give you a crown of everlasting life. He that overcomes these things will not be harmed of the second death. And so here again, we see in the book of the Revelation, the scroll where this takes place. We go down clear down to the end and we see the second death is what happens after the last resurrection, after the thousand year reign of Messiah upon the earth. Then, the last resurrection, the resurrection of the unjust. And then all those whose names aren't written in the book of life are cast into the lake of fire where death and hell are destroyed. And when they are cast in the lake of fire, it says, and this is the second death. Blessed are those who take part in the first resurrection the resurrection that transpires when Yeshua comes back at the seventh trumpet and rescues us, those who are in Messiah, they will not be harmed by the second death. They are going to be gathered together. After the first death, their bodies, their rotted bodies will be given an immortal body. and the mortal will put on immortality at that moment. That is what transpires at the seventh trumpet. Those who are in Messiah, those who are raised, those whose body are changed, they are the ones that are gathered to the sea of fire and glass. Upon them, the second death has no part. They are not going to be tried at the end to see if their name is is in the book of life. No, they've already passed from death unto life. 
We have already made it. Now we are to live and reign with Messiah upon the earth. And then the last judgment. He that overcomes these things will be given a crown of life and the second death has no authority over them at all. Hey, Torah fans, on behalf of everyone here at Arut Awakening, I just wanna say thank you, because without you, nothing happens. There's no corporate safety net with a pile of money, in case there's not enough, there's no government grant that keeps things going, and we don't ask companies outside this ministry to pay for commercials. In fact, some have offered and we have declined, because we think this ministry should run on willing hearts, not commercial contracts. So, thank you for having a willing heart. You are the reason for every rude awakening. Now, I'm going to continue reading here. And this is the letter to Pergamos. Pergamos, these things saith he that has the double-edged sword. And Yeshua was seen with a double-edged sword out of his mouth. L not literally a double-edged sword coming out of his mouth, but the words he spoke cut like a two-edged sword. The words coming out of his mouth cut to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, joints and the marrow. There is nothing sharper. His word is the knife edge. This is the sword of Yeshua that is always during his ministry separated between the doctrines and commandments of men, in Greek, the dogmas, the dogmas of men, and the didaskalos, the teachings of Moses. He says, I know your works and where you dwell. I know where you live, even where Satan's seat is. You have had, held fast to my name, and you have not denied my faith. Even in the days that Antipas, my faithful martyr, was slain among you at the very seat where Satan dwells, and that is exactly what was built at Pergamos, the seat of Satan, the seat of Satan, and this is where believers in Yeshua Messianic believers were tortured and they were killed. And this is a time there was great persecution and they were just mass slaughtering the believers on the seat of Satan. Now the seat of Satan was, was disassembled from Pergamos and it was taken to Berlin. And when it was taken to Berlin, then Adolf Hitler, had the parade ground at Nuremberg, he had the reviewing stand in the very image of the seat of Satan. I have been there, I've seen that. Now, the seat of Satan is what Hitler used as the parade ground. While the seat of Satan from Pergamum was there, in Berlin, after the Third Reich was defeated, then the Russians took the seat of Satan and they took it to Moscow. And when they took it there, another 30 to 60 million people were murdered. Now, the seat of Satan has been returned to Berlin. And the Democratic National Convention a number of years ago, when they had their convention, they built the replica of the seat of Satan and that is where the president, Barack Obama, was inaugurated as the candidate for the president of the United States. It was an exact replica by design of the seat of Satan. Exactly the same thing as in Nuremberg at Hitler's parade ground, the very thing that is now back in Berlin in the museum. 
history is repeating itself. And this is where the great persecution was taking place. You've had fast, fast to my name. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. You have among you those who are held by the doctrine of Balaam, who by Balak tempted the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idol and seduced them to commit sexual immorality. You also have among you those that embrace the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Both of these perversions were going on in Pergamos, right where the seat of Satan is, with all this persecution that was going on, with the entire culture standing against them. And sometimes we see the culture around us and we see, is there any hope? Yes, there is hope because we are called to be salt and light, like they were called to be salt and light. Yes, and being salt and light got many of them killed. But they said, you still have to get things cleaned up. You still have those who are holding on to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. You still have those who are held by the doctrine of Balaam. And here it tells us a little bit about the doctrine of Balaam that he taught Balak, the Moabite king, to tempt the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to seduce them to commit sexual immorality. Well, in order to deal with this, now in order to understand this, we have to go back to the record of Balaam. We have to see how this plays into the record in the book of the Revelation. Because again, the book of the Revelation is the most hyperlinked text in all of scripture. The stories that need to be told to understand the book of Revelation, that is what we're going to do. And we're going to go right to the plains of Moab with the children of Israel and with Balaam and Balak. In Numbers chapter 22, we read that the children of Israel were camping on the plains of Moab on the other side of Jordan just before coming into Jericho. We had already told the Moabites that we will pay for the water that we use, we'll pay for the grain, we'll take care of anything that we have to use, just let us pass through the land. We were not to have any negative interaction, we were not to conquer the Moabites or the Ammonites, they are the seed of Lot, who is Abraham's nephew, and the Midianites are Abraham's children by way of Keturah. So they were safe. We were told, do not mess with these people. And so, while we were camping there, the king of the Moabites, Balak, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites, and, and the Moabites were sore afraid of the people because they were so many. And Moab was distressed because of the children of Israel, and so Balak, the king of the Moabites, he sent messengers to Balaam, the son of Baor, which is by a particular river in that area, and he said to the emissaries to go to Balaam and say, there is a people that have come out of Egypt. They cover the whole face of the earth. They're abiding over against me, and I need you to come and curse this people for me because they're too mighty for me because I need to prevail against them. So you come and curse them, that I may drive them out of the land, because I know who you blessed is blessed, and I know who you curse is cursed. And so the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian, they came together and departed with the rewards of divination in their hand. And this is what you do when you go see a man of God, a prophet. You just won't come empty-handed, you would come because you would want something from him and you would give him a blessing, a gift. A, it could be a nominal gift, but they came to Balaam and they spoke all the words of Balak and said, Balaam, to them, you spend the night 
and I will bring you a word again. I'm going to see if Yehovah, and he actually used his name, uh, see if Yehovah will speak to me. And so the princes of Moab abode with Balaam that night. And God gave, came to Balaam and said, what are these men with you? And Balaam said, Balak, the son of Zippor, the king of Moab, sent them to me and with this message. There are people who have come out of Egypt and they covered the face of the earth, come and curse them for me, that I may overcome them and drive them out. And God said to Balaam, thou shalt not go with them. Thou shalt not curse the people, for they are blessed. So Balaam rose up in the morning and said to the princes of the Moabites and the Midianites, the princes that Balak sent, go back to your land, for Yehovah refuses to give me leave to go with you. And so the princes of Moab rose up and went back to Balaam, or went back to Balak and said that Balaam refuses to come with us. And then Balak sent yet again more and more princes, more honorable than they were. And they came to Balaam and said, Balak says, don't let anything stop you from coming to me. I am going to promote you to great honor and I will do whatsoever you say. I am giving you a blank check. Here's the check. You fill it out with any amount. There is nothing, there is nothing that I'm going to refrain from you. I am going to bring you great honor and I am going to do whatever you say to me. Just come and curse these people. And Balaam, when he saw the servants of Balak, these noble princes and all the gifts, all the, the, the caravan that came with all this wealth, he said to them, if Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go, on, go beyond the word of Jehovah my God to do less or to do more. But now I, I pray you tarry with me tonight and because I am going to ask the Lord and see if Yehovah will give me a little bit more information. You know, perhaps he didn't know, you know, that you've offered a blank check. And so, God came to Balaam that night and said to him, listen to this, people. If the man come to call you, then rise up and go with them. But yet, the word which I say to you, that is what you shall do. If the man call you, now I'm gonna translate that for you. You are going to go to bed. You're gonna stay in bed. You're not gonna move a muscle. And if they come and call you, if they call you, then rise up and go with them, but even then, you only do what I tell you to do. If you've watched Shabbat Night Live for any length of time, you know we're always talking about something called the love gift. What is that? Well, it's what allows you to see this show right now. Seriously, that's why we talk about it all the time. The love gift is just that, a gift to say thank you and we love you, really. I mean, without your love and support, this program cannot happen. So yes, we love you, and we want to give you something back when you give your hard-earned money to A Rude Awakening, because we appreciate that. And you might not know this, but when we invite a guest to do a series on Shabbat Night Live, we ask them to reserve an extra special teaching for the love gift teaching, something that is not broadcast anywhere. In fact, you can't get it anywhere except for the love gift. And because of that, you get some pretty controversial teachings that we literally cannot put anywhere else. So if you'd like an extra special teaching for your extra special donation, go to monthlylovegift.com. We'll give you the teaching and even some unique gift items on top of that. Plus, it changes every month. So go ahead and see what's new right now at monthlylovegift.com. Verse 21, and Balaam rose up in the morning and saddled his ass. 
Is that what the Almighty said to do? Get up in the morning, saddle your ass, stand outside the window. <coughs> Make as much racket as you possibly can. No, he said, if they come and call you, then get up and go with them. But he wanted the money. He wanted the money. And so he did not listen. And every translation out there, and I have, I have watched so many of those who you know, have tried to interpret this and they missed it. And it says, because these people came, no, he said, if they come and call you, not because they, they offered you so much money, but if they call you, that is what I'm telling you, then you can rise up. But, but Balaam rose up, saddled his ass, went with the princes of Moab, and God's anger was kindled because he went. He was mad. He said, if, and he just did it anyway. God's anger was kindled, and the angel of Yehovah stood in the way as an adversary against him. Now he was riding upon his ass, and uh, ass, this is equus asininus in Latin. Um, uh, you know, I see some translations donkey, but donkey is a slang term uh, that came about in 1785. Uh, it, it means a, a dun horse, a dun horse, a, a dun-colored horse, kind of a brownish red horse. That's what a donkey is. We're not gonna go that way. We're not gonna use slang. We're gonna go right by what the scripture says, the, the real scripture here. So he, he, he then, Balaam, was riding upon his ass, and his two servants were with him. And the ass saw the angel of Yehovah standing in the way with his sword drawn in his hand. The angel had a sword in his hand, and the ass turned aside out of the way and went out into the field and Balaam smote his ass. And so he was beating his ass to turn him into, back into the way. And the angel of the Lord then saw this as Balaam was beating his ass and his ass turned back and, and then went back on the path. But the angel of Yehovah stood in the path of the vineyard a wall being on this side and on that side. And when the ass saw the angel of Yehovah with the sword in his hand, she thrust herself into the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall. And he smote his ass again. The second time he's beating his ass. And the angel of Yehovah then went further and stood in a narrow place and there was no way around him not to the right or the left hand. And when the ass saw the angel of Yehovah, she crumbled, fell down under Balaam, and Balaam's anger was kindled. And he then took a snap, he got a rod, and he got off his ass and started beating his ass mercilessly, mercilessly. And then Yehovah opened the mouth of the ass, and the ass said unto Balaam, what have I done to you? Why have you smitten me these three times? And Balaam said to the ass, because you mocked me, you mocked me. If I had a sword in my hand, I would kill you. And the ass said to Balaam, am I not your ass upon which you've ridden ever since I was even to this day? Was I ever known to do this to you? And Balaam said, no, but you've never spoken to me like this before either. And then Yehovah opened the eyes of Balaam. He saw the angel of Yehovah standing in the way, his sword, sword drawn in his hand, and he bowed down his head and then fell flat on his face. 
And the angel of Yahweh said to him, why have you spent your ass three times? Three times. Behold, I went out to withstand you because you are perverse. You did not do what Yehovah said. You got up in the morning, you made as much damn racket as you could until everyone was awake and then you saddled the ass and then you left. And so, this, your ass, has turned away three times and unless your ass had turned away from me, I would have slain, I would have slain you. Your ass has saved you. And Balaam said to the angel of Yehovah, I have sinned. I didn't know that it was you standing in the way. Now, if what I've done displeases you, I will go back again. And the angel of Yehovah said to Balaam, Balaam, go with these men, but only the word that I shall speak, that is what you shall speak. So Balaam went with the princes of Balak. And when Balak had heard that Balaam was come, he went out to meet him to a city of Moab, which is in the border. And Balak said to Balaam, did I not earnestly call you and why didn't you come to me? Am I not indeed able to promote you to great honor? And Balaam said, I have now come to you, but I don't have any power at all to say anything. The word which God puts in my mouth, that is the only thing that I will speak. And Balaam went with Balak and they came to carry out Zimoth. And Balak offered oxen and sheep and sent to Balaam and to the princes that were with him. So it was literally, you know, offered oxen and sheep, and so then he fed them from this offering that he made. And it came to pass on the following morning that Balak took Balaam and brought him to the high place of Baal, high place of the Lord, as it says in Hebrew, Baal is simply the Lord. Nondescript title, it doesn't mean Yehovah, it doesn't mean, it just means the Lord. One of the high places that he might see the utmost of the people. And Balaam said to Balak, build me here seven altars and prepare here seven oxen and seven rams. So Balak did as Balaam had spoken and he offered on every altar a bullock and a ram. And then Balaam said to Balak, stand here by the burnt offering and I will go and peradventure Yehovah will come to meet me. And whatever he shows me, that I'll tell you. And so he went to this high place and, and God met with Balaam. And Balaam said to God, I have prepared seven altars and I've offered upon every altar a bullock and a ram. And then Yehovah put a word in Balaam's mouth. Now, we have to, first of all, we have to step back because now they have taken the, all the princes, the king and all the princes, they have taken them up to a summit where they could see all of Israel. This is the United Nations. This is Ammonites, the Moabites, the Midianites. It's all the nations have gathered together and they are all afraid of Israel because Abraham was given a promise. All the land from the Euphrates to the Nile belongs to Israel. And they are coming in to take the land that was given to them across the Jordan River and they're not interfering with anyone. But... They don't want them to do so. So what happens? They have a United Nations summit meeting and they build seven altars with, and on those altars they offer a lamb and a ram. And then Yehovah put a word in Balaam's mouth and said, return to Balak and this is what you're going to speak. And so he returned to him as he stood by the burnt sacrifice, he and all the princes of Moab, and he took up this parable, this parable. Parable is a parallel. It is a story that has a parallel on two different planes. One is a physical plane, one's on a spiritual plane. A parable is a parallel. That's the easiest way to remember it, and that is precisely what it is. There are parallels. 
And he took up this parable and said, Balak, the king of Moab, had brought me out of Aram. This is Syria, uh, the land of the Arameans. Out of the mountains of thee, saying, come and curse Jacob for me, and come and defy Israel. How shall I curse whom God has not cursed? How shall I defy whom Yehovah has not defied? For from the top of the rocks I see him, from the hills I behold him. Lo, the people shall dwell alone and shall not be reckoned among the nations. No, they are a nation of priests and kings. They are separate from the nations. Who can count the dust of Jacob and the number of the fourth part of Israel? Let me die the death of the righteous and may my last end be like his. And Balak said, what have you done? I took you up here to curse my enemies and you blessed them all together. And Balaam said, I have to speak that which Jehovah puts in my mouth. Then Balak said, come, I pray you with me to another place that you may see it. And so he took him up to the top of Mount Pisgah and another mountaintop, another seven altars. And he then offers seven bullock and seven rams upon that altar. And again, he stands by that sacrifice and Balaam goes out and the Almighty again has him bless Israel. No one is going to touch Israel. No one touches Israel. And then he comes back and Balaam, Balak is infuriated and takes him up to a third mountain peak and builds another seven altars and sacrifices seven rams and seven lambs. And then Balaam comes back with another posse. The shout of a king is among them. Their king, a king, the scepter, will come out of Jacob, out, out of Israel, and out of Judah. Three times, three separate times, a United Nations summit meeting. And what is this parable? What is this parable? In 1993, Israel was called to a United Nations summit meeting in Oslo, Oslo, Norway. Oslo, which in Hebrew means toilet seat, but that's the capital of Norway. And there, they made a seven-year peace plan, a seven-year plan in which the land that was promised to Abraham by covenant forever would be given over to Israel's enemies for the promise of peace. Then, seven years later, that having fell, failed, the Camp David summit, in which the United Nations again got together and declared another seven-year peace plan. And then, seven years later, in the year 2007, the Annapolis Summit, three times they put together a plan that those who are doing wickedly against God's covenant with Abraham, that all this land is, belongs to Israel. It is the promise to Abraham, and no one is going to circumvent this in three times, on three UN summits, seven years, each one of them, this is the parable, the parallel. Daniel said, those that do wickedly against the covenant will corrupt by flatteries. They'll make their plan, but the Almighty is going to do his thing, his act, his very mysterious act. And as the prophet Isaiah, who spoke of the covenant with death, the agreement with hell that Israel's leaders would enter into and that God would annul that covenant with death, he would annul that covenant agreement with hell by violence. And when that violence takes place, it is going to change the face of the earth. In the end, it is the Messiah who will rule and all the land from the Euphrates to the Nile will go into the hands of the sons of Abraham, the sons 
of Isaac, the sons of Jacob, the sons of Israel. Whenever and wherever you are watching this broadcast, it represents hundreds of man hours of production and post-production, and then it goes out to the world in several different languages. Why is this possible? It's because people like you support this ministry. We do our best to get this out freely to the entire world. Freely, you have received. Now, this is your opportunity to do as Yeshua said and freely give. Shalom, Torah fans. Give this video a thumbs up and share it with a friend. Tap the subscription button and the bell icon, and I promise to update weekly with in-depth biblical research. Be sure to download the new michaelrood.tv app for both mobile and home devices for even more commercial-free content.